So I'm going to ask Helen if you wouldn't mind uh, to introduce Mark, our speaker, and uh, we'll get going. Thank you guys for coming. And uh, thank you, Helen. Yes. Um, I'm sorry for that. Gal Hot. Gal Hot. That's it. You're a great woman. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Hi. Thank you all for coming tonight, and it's so exciting, especially to see a surprise, uh, surprise visitors from the pachyderms, and especially our central committee folks here. That is really exciting because that does mean that we do have a chance to take Missouri back. So I'm just thrilled to death. Thank you for being here, everyone. I want to introduce Mark Hurd this evening, our keynote speaker for the Center for Self Governance. Mark is probably the only national speaker you'll ever meet who draws no salary for what he does. He's retired Air Force, and because of that, we're fortunate he's a Gulf War vet, third generation Air Force guy, Air Force brat too. <laughs> and uh, because of that, it allows him to be able to do what he loves, and that's work for his country gratis. So uh, he is president and co-founder of Center for Self-Governance, and uh, Mark shared the stage with uh, Senators Palin and Cruz at the Veterans Million Vets March uh, this past October. And uh, it was real, if you would have seen, and you can still see Mark on YouTube, it'll bring a tear to even the toughest guy's eyes, I promise you, when Mark speaks uh, on that stage that day. It was an amazing speech. So we're, we're really grateful for everything that he does. He does travel coast to coast, and he travels from one border to the other. And his message is simple. Uh, we shared it with Phyllis Schlafly a few weeks ago. We met with uh, Mrs. Schlafly in her office here in town. And we spent over two and a half hours with Phyllis in her office. And we brought her the materials that Mark teaches and sat in front of her. And I was so nervous. My heart was beating. And I thought, oh, what is she going to say? And she studied everything that he brought and showed her what he's been doing, what he's created. And she finally looked up. And she had this gleam in her eye like it was Christmas. And she said, where on God's earth did you get this marvelous material? <laughs> so I, I was just, we were so excited. And she thought it was also appropriate for homeschooling use. So um, anyone can understand it. It's very simple. Center for Self-Governance has absolutely zero agenda, no agenda of their own. The only thing is they give us citizens the tools to be able to do the work that we need to do <coughs> to take our country back. Thank you, Mark Kerr. So I'm trying to figure out why there's a table full of young guys here. It's Valentine's Day. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm really shocked that you guys are here on a Valentine's Day evening. Uh, when it's icy outside, thank goodness that Pat put stuff down so people wouldn't go flying all over the place. Um, uh, thank you for opening the venue to us. We're very, very grateful. Um, thanks to Helen and her husband, Paul, for they, they're so hospitable. Uh, coming to St. Louis, uh, every time I come to St. Louis, there's always um, a place to stay. And Helen becomes... Um, she like turns into this superwoman, <laughs> save the Republic superwoman. Um, it's amazing. Um, so they always ask for like your background. They wanna know how special you are and how awesome your background is and what's your pedigree and all this other stuff. And I don't have one, I really, I honestly, don't have one. I just started four years ago asking a simple question. How do I keep the Republic? I just kept asking it over and over every single day. I still ask the question today. How do I keep the Republic? Am I keeping the Republic? What steps do I need to take to keep the Republic? How many of you guys feel like you're losing the Republic? All right. How many of you feel like you're keeping it? Okay. Well, for those of you that raised your hands, how, how do we keep it? Remind them where we came from. Remind them where we came from. Understand how it works. Understand how it works. Yeah. Ignite that brush fire. Right. 
There you go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is a very, very difficult question uh, to answer because the founders who created this society created something very unique in mankind's history. Um, so I'm uh, don't please don't think that I'm some expert, special, whatever. I'm just here trying to explore with you how to keep our republic. Um, I don't have any other agenda. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we've been doing for four years. We have been exploring how do you keep the republic? What are the ingredients to actually keeping this republic? If you want to lose it, you're already on that pathway, <laughs> right? So that means whatever we're doing sucks, <laughs> right? I'm just right. saying, if you feel like you're losing the republic, okay, if 90, 98% of the people in this room feel like they're losing the republic, that means whatever we're doing to keep it, it's not working, <laughs> all right? right? So in military terms, what a general will tell you, the general will say your strategy sucks. That's what they'll say. They'll say your strategy sucks, they'll throw it on the floor, they'll probably step on it, and they'll say, okay, go make a new one. All right, so you have to answer that question every day. How do you keep the republic for yourself? Because again, it's something very unique. Uh, it, for the first time in mankind's history, this philosophy of something called self-government came into being. The terminology is in the writings and in the speeches and in the inaugural addresses of all of the framers. If you, if you read their history and their letters to one another, they mention this thing called self-governance. So I was like wondering, well, what is that? Because it was the first time you started hearing about this concept, something called self-governance. And today you have people trying to define self-governance. Our name is called Center for Self-Governance. Um, there's organizations that say self-governance is making the most decisions for yourself, doing what's best for you. Well, that's what we've been doing for the last 236 years, and we're still losing the republic. So it probably doesn't have anything to do with that definition when it comes down to keeping a republic. So there are some, some key points that I want to point out tonight for your, for your sake to make the case that there is a paradigm shift that you have to experience personally in order to keep your republic. So we don't drive your issues, we don't drive your candidates, we're only focused on you. Why? Because Barack Obama is not the solution to keeping the republic, he's the solution to losing it. Well, so is John McCain. And quite frankly, every government official is not the solution to keeping the republic. The solution is like watching the movie National Treasure. All you have to do is find it in the writings of the framers. You can find the solution. It's like a, it's like a treasure map. Um, and so we've been, we've been researching, uh, asking a lot of questions. I'm, I'm telling you the truth from the bottom of my heart. That's all I ask every day. How do I keep my republic? Um, so last week we met in Texas and we sat down for six hours with David Barton and um, just it's, been a, it's just a phenomenal experience. He, he downloaded so much information about self-governance and the role of citizens in keeping the republic. He talked about the biblical context by which Christians are obligated biblically from this golden thread from Genesis to Revelation with regards to what is your role as a human being in your society? What, what is your purpose? What's your function? What, what do you do? How do you, how do you function? It's not just about breathing, right? You're alive, you exist, what do you do? It's, it's like the human condition, right? As we ask that question every day, well, what am I supposed to do? Why am I here? Um, there's a gold thread of governance from a biblical perspective, from Genesis to Revelation. There's also a gold thread in the Bible regarding something that the founders referred to often, the sacred fire of liberty, the fire in your bosom, the liberty, the, the, the lamp of liberty in the bosom of man's soul, the brush fires of freedom. They referred to this a lot uh, in their writings. They were referring to this golden thread, this struggle that mankind has had since we've recorded history, the struggle that we have between you and your government. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a historical struggle. It's, it's, a matter of fact, it's never ending. Right? It's a struggle between your opinion about how government should control me 
in my opinion, about how government should control you. And it's historical. And it's not going to end. The key is, is how do you participate in maintaining the balance of that struggle? It's out of control right now, right? That's why you feel like you're losing it. It's out of balance. The reason it's out of balance is because of this little known secret solution. I call it the super simple secret sauce solution found in the framers' writings and speeches. Um, don't worry about that stuff. It, it, it doesn't distract me at all. Um, <coughs> ladies, I got a question for you. So in 1787, what didn't you have? The right to vote. Property. It, it depended on which state you lived in, which colony. And the third most important one. No, no, you, they were your children. It was your political rights. You, you didn't have the right to vote in certain states, and in certain states you didn't have the right to own property. And what else? Speech, were you? Just the ladies, just the ladies. You could not hold office. Well, ladies, so what can you hold today? If you wanted to, you can hold office, right? Mm -hmm. And you also have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a little known, there's a little studied um, interaction between a woman with no political rights in 1787 and one of the framers of the Constitution. And most of the concentration is on him and his response to this woman. But little concentration is spent on this woman with no political rights. It's, it's like watching the movie National Treasure, except you're not finding a bunch of gold, you're like finding the solution to keeping a republic. In this exchange, she approaches him just as he's walking out of the Constitutional Convention, and she asks him a very important question. She says, Doctor, what have you given us, a monarchy or a republic? And ladies, do, do you know what his answer, his response was? Well, if you're as rebellious as I am, an inquiring mind, because I just ask the same question every day, right? How do I keep a republic? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, without your political rights, wouldn't you ask this great doctor who just signed this new social contract that created this new awesome country, uh, how? I can't vote. I can't hold office. How am I supposed to keep a republic? Fine, doctor. <laughs> so, that's a great rhetorical question, but how? How do you keep a republic? Right? The ones who said we're keeping it. The women, the women got it now. You've got the vote. Right? You've got the office. But the majority of your fellow citizens say, feel, we're, we're losing it. I thought it had everything to do with voting and holding office. So maybe, maybe his response should have been to this woman, it's a republic if your legislator can keep it. Or maybe it's uh, maybe it's maybe maybe you keep the republic um, if you win your issue, right? Like you, maybe you maybe you abolish the Fed and we'll keep the republic. Maybe maybe you uh, get rid of Obamacare and you'll keep the republic. Hey, which which issue? Which candidate is going to help you keep the republic? It's a, it's a legitimate question, and it's never, it's actually, it's never been explored. So you've got, you've got this woman with no political rights asking a doctor who signed the Constitution, so what'd you give us a republic? And his response to her, it's a republic if you can keep it. The answer to this question comes in 1820 from Thomas Jefferson. And he's six years away from dying. Uh, it's 46 years since he wrote the Declaration of Independence. <coughs> and um, he, you, you guys all know about the Declaration of Independence, right? Here, so he, it's basically the preamble to self-governance. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? And to secure rights, these unalienable rights, in, governments are instituted among men deriving their just 
What's that? Powers from the consent of the governed. Eventually he talks about these instituted governments, right? They derive their powers. The laws of nature is assumed among the powers of the earth. And eventually we organize these powers. Here in America, we've organized them into local, state, and federal government. Yes? Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. It's interesting that even in your constitution, the Missouri Constitution, the very first sentence, <coughs> the very first sentence in the, in the, in the Missouri Constitution, it, it, it doesn't talk about political rights. The very first thing it talks about is that all political power is vested in and derived from the people. Um, and this is important. It's it's the solution. It, it's the it's the it's like this little it's like the map was sitting on the wall, like on national treasures, like in the it's engraved in the stuff. You know what I mean? It's just sitting there, and everybody's been walking by it for hundred years. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> the solution is in this little lady with no political rights. Uh, if you study her you'll find out how much power she wielded. <laughs> uh, you ever, guys, you ever, not, not, now it's to the guys, you ever heard of the uh, phrase, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? <laughs> All the ladies are like, uh-huh. <laughs> That's right. They that phrase. Yeah, they invented the phrase. <laughs> they didn't just invent it, they'd like carry it out. <laughs> so here, here you have this woman, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and she and her husband own this bed and breakfast there. The framers are coming in and out of their house because they have a bed and breakfast, and it's just a couple blocks from uh, the convention hall there um, in Philadelphia. <coughs> and uh, so they're, they're entertaining the founders and the framers, and. She ends up building a, a very strong friendship with uh, George and Martha Washington. So much to the point that she directly influences him to run for a second term as president of the United States. So ladies, what's your influence with Barack Obama? Right? Abigail Adams, she's married to the second president of the United States and she writes him a letter in which she says, John, Arbitrary power is hard enough as most things are, but we have it within our power to subdue our masters and to throw all your natural and legal authority at your feet. It's a pretty powerful statement coming from a woman in 1776, three weeks before he joins the committee to write the Declaration of Independence with Thomas Jefferson. And if you guys know the, the story, he ends up stepping aside and Thomas ends up writing it instead. And if you read the letter carefully, you'll find that she's essentially excoriating her husband for spending so much time in all of his high-mindedness and neglecting her and her family. <clears throat> Pretty powerful. It was, it was very powerful. So this whole thing has nothing to do with political rights. Your right to vote, your gay rights, your education rights, your health care rights, your gun rights, your property <coughs> rights, all these rights, rights, rights. I'm right, you're not right, I'm right, and you're wrong, I'm right. Eventually, the whole country is completely divided into all these sectarian rights groups, and we end up losing the republic. <clears throat> the premise that the founders established the United States on was the premise that individuals, human beings, are the source of power. And if you don't wield it, eventually, all of your power gets controlled by those who will control your power. It's the, it's the repetition of history. You guys are passing through, we, are, we all are passing through the repetition of history. There's nothing new under the sun. Where there's no vision, the people perish. What's the vision? The vision was clear. Elizabeth Powell, with one L, wielded her power. Abigail Adams, the wife of the second president of the United States, wait for her political rights. She wielded her power. As an individual, where did that come from? It came from the thoughts, the vision articulated in the Declaration of Independence. The laws of nature and of nature's God assume 
among the powers of the earth. Our separate and equal station. So <clears throat> you've got this vision. You have this people. They were, weren't waiting for political rights. They were just wielding power. They didn't need self-governance training. They just did it. You guys heard of a guy named Levi Preston? Um, Levi Preston uh, said in three sentences what Thomas Jefferson took five weeks to write in the Declaration of Independence. And not, not even the same intellect level at all, right? Thomas Jefferson, intellect, Levi Preston. Keep going, all right? And this is what he said. He was being interviewed at the age of 91, 1843. And he says to his interviewee, interviewer, we always governed ourselves. We always meant to. Red coats didn't mean we should. <laughs> right? Thomas Jefferson took five weeks to write two paragraphs to say the same thing. <laughs> the reason why Levi Preston and Elizabeth Powell and Abigail Adams, people of not such great prominence as you would think like Jefferson or, or Franklin or Washington, you have these individual human beings who understood intrinsically what it meant to wield their power. And as a people today, we've lost that vision. We've lost the vision that the citizens can actually wield power. They just don't know how. So our training program. <clears throat> I'll just, all I can do is tell you the results and then I can answer some questions. In Washington State, uh, we've graduated some level five students and we have quite a number of um, classes throughout the state there. And so now it's their legislative session like it is for you guys, right? And so our students are inside the legislature at the, at the, in Olympia. And you guys are familiar with, with Washington to a little bit of a degree. It's, it's pretty nuts there. Um, well, it's kind of nuts everywhere, isn't it, right now? <laughs> it's just a different. It's just a different nut. It's the same nut. Yeah. All right. Um, so anyway, now they show up, and you're, you're with the Center for Self Governance. Well, well, come into the office. So now the students. So now these students, regular citizens, they're not paid lobbyists. They're just learning how to wield their power as a citizen. Uh, legislators, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, it's a very purple state, um, are now recognizing these students for the credibility they have because the quality of our training teaches citizens how to interact with their government, um, not just respectfully, but appropriately. Um, the founders had, they, they had a vision <laughs> with regards to self-governance. Um, Arizona, right now it's a highly divided state uh, between, um, I guess, I, I, don't know, I don't know all the dynamics, I just know it's divided within the Republican Party there. There's, there's a lot of division. And they just censured John McCain. And <coughs> um, the Maricopa County GOP, it's the, lar it's the largest county GOP in the nation. Uh, 3.4 million people in that one county. Uh, it's, it's just huge, huge. Um, so they just censured John McCain, and they have just uh, basically said, look, we're not going to have any more candidates to speak to us until we get our act together as citizens, which is astounding for, because the GOP, that's, I mean, the whole purpose of a political party is to find candidates, right? <laughs> But here they are saying, we're not going to hear from them until we get our act together. And so for their Lincoln Day dinner on March 8th, their first keynote speaker is going to be the Center for Self-Governance, yeah. which is really cool. Um, that's a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal for, for our organization, but it's also a big deal because the solution to keeping the republic is not the issue or the candidate. The solution of the keeping the republic is Mrs. Powell. Mm -hmm. and, and we are Mrs. Powell. Um, I'll give you an example. Right here in Missouri, you have, a, you have a level five team down in Cape County. And for their level five homework, they simply introduced a single policy change to put the superintendent not on notice, but in the uncomfortable position of exposing the fact 
that he could care less that you are a parent. Mm. That simple. And so now what's happening is she's starting to expose herself. Yesterday, or excuse me, the day before yesterday, she flipped off this entire team. Flipped them off in a public meeting. So the point here is, is that what's going on is citizens are learning how to self-govern. The definition of self-governance is not what you, you may think it is. It's not the conventional wisdom of making the most decisions for yourself. Self-governance from the founder's perspective was you controlling your instituted government. So let me just ask you guys a couple questions. And then I'll wrap up. You can ask some questions. Are you in control of your school board? Are you in control of your city council? Absolutely. Your county commission? Is it board of supervisors here? County council. Your county councils, are you in control? No. Are you controlling your state legislature? Are you controlling your federal delegation? So when it comes to your relationship with your government, this inheritance given to you by people who created this new type of government, it's not Plato's Republic. It's a different type of republic. In your relationship with your, those five levels of government, who is in control of whom? Who's the master and who's the Rottweiler? Who's the rancher and who's the cow herd? Who is in control of whom? The key is in that little exchange with a woman with no political rights. It's a republic, madam. Not if I can keep it. Not if George Washington, the potential monarch, can keep it. It's not in the stroke of a pen, because that's all I need. No. It's if you can keep it. So self-governance is your self-determination to control your instituted government. It's really that simple, but let me tell you, it's very, very difficult. It's like being a Navy SEAL. You know, they get them off the bus, they shave their heads, they take their clothes off, and they go shove them in 58 degree water in the Pacific Ocean for four hours on their backs as the tide's coming in while they're doing this with their feet. It's, it's a lot like that. That's why the end of the Declaration of Independence is just as great as the first two paragraphs. Amen. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, fortunes, and our sacred honor. They meant it. The problem is, because the vision's not there today, in most cases, we look to someone else who means it, right? That's why I hesitate when I get people introduce me and they say all these accolades, because I am mutually pledged. I can say it. But I'm here to train citizens who also want to mutually pledge their life, their fortune, their sacred honor to keep the republic. I have no other agenda. I'm not here to destroy parties. I'm not here to create parties. We're not here to do any of that stuff. We're simply here to fulfill the vision that the founders had with regards to a self-governing society, in which James Madison said, every de honorable determination which animates every votary of freedom, we based all of our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. Um, our training program is profound, exhausting, it's about $325 for five levels, seven to nine months of torture from us. <laughs> There's homework involved. You build relationships. Your brain will be stretched beyond your wildest imaginations. You'll write things. You'll be speaking. You'll be building relationships inside the legislatures of various levels of government. You'll be forging relationships with people you never thought possible. I did a class in Sacramento, California that was 26 atheists. And I was in Texas just a few weeks ago with 26 Christians, all speaking the same language of self-governance. I was in a class in Gig Harbor, Washington that had a Democrat representative with the Republican chairman, the Libertarian Party, the atheist, Christians, college student, elderly, and two candidates running against each other in the same race. <laughs> we, are, we are nonpartisan. We're only focused on teaching citizens how to keep a republic and exploring that with you. We have a safe training environment for which you can explore, innovate, and do the same thing that Elizabeth Powell did. She explored. She innovated despite not having political rights. 
She stood up, wielded her power, and because of it, you had a president who ran for a second term of office. Right? You ended up with John Adams who steps aside because of the influence of his wife's words when she says, we have it within our power to subdue our masters and throw all your natural and legal authority at your feet. As a result, you have one of the greatest documents ever written with regards to mankind self-government. The founders were in harmony because they shared the same vision. And so they, they actually pledged life, fortune, and sacred honor. They did it. They didn't just talk about it. Our training program is not just a talk about it program. We're not gonna talk to you about the Constitution and make you feel good, right? I don't want you to leave this presentation tonight feeling great. I light your pilot light of liberty in your soul. But the bottom line is that pilot light is lit with the sacred fire of liberty that George Washington referred to in his first inaugural address. And it should spread from your soul into your mind as a brush fire of freedom. But that's not where it ends. Eventually, eventually, metaphorically, you become a human torch of liberty and freedom. You want to talk about getting rid of the plastic fire of fear and tyranny? Like this fire. You like this fire? It becomes Dante's Inferno. It's unstoppable. It is. It literally is. The more contact I have with citizens and our instructors and our, and our organization has with regular citizens across the country, I feel like I'm literally living National Treasure, the movie. There are the, you guys are the best. You are the treasure. The National Treasure is not in the White House or in the Capitol building or in the Supreme Court. That's not where America's treasure is. America's treasure in the founding father's mind. That's why George Washington, after he said the sacred fire of liberty, he said, the destiny of the Republican model of government is staked on the experiment entrusted into the hands of the American people. It's why he refused to become a monarch. Uh, they were on the same page. We're not on the same page today because we've lost the vision. We've lost the solution. But it actually, it's right in front, it's, it's sitting right here. It's kind of, it's kind of, it feels weird saying that. The solution is sitting here. So I have utmost respect for the citizens of this country because in the end, it's ours to lose or keep. Uh, I hope you'll check out our website. Um, you can coordinate with Helen. We have classes all over the freaking country. <laughs> I'm flying all over the place. Um, we're building instructors as fast as we can. Um, We've started, a, we've started an inferno of liberty. Um, there's a level one class in Fenton on Sunday. I, I don't know where that's at, but I know it's here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, there'll be more classes throughout the year. Um, it takes you seven to nine months to complete our training program. It's intense. It requires a, a lot of you. But if you really want to keep the republic, you have to ask yourself the question every day, how? How? And I, I can say from myself, I see it. It's not with the issues and the candidates. It's with you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to ask if you are also approaching some of the politicians. <coughs> they are also citizens. They are also human beings. Maybe they're misguided. Maybe they haven't, they haven't the flame. They haven't the understanding. Maybe they're trying. Uh, we do. Um, we had a Democrat, Charles Curtis from Tennessee, who is going through our training program. We had a Democrat from Washington who's passing through our program. We've had a, from school board, city council, county commission, state reps, and senators, uh, but none of the federal delegations are willing to take the class so far. <clears throat> um, we, we're open to anybody, it's nonpartisan. I had a male prostitute in a class in California. Um, we'll take anybody. <clears throat> anybody. Yes, sir. What, what have I heard? <coughs> What's your, uh, <clears throat> where have the people gone that have taken some or all of the classes as far as <clears throat> uh, I believe a number go on into representation of the, of the people, of us? Yeah. Uh, what, what is the rate on that? It's kind of funny. The majority of our students, after they find out how much power they actually have um, <clears throat> as a citizen, 
Uh, I had a, a I'll, I'll tell you a story of one young lady. Um, her name's Yvonne. She's from Tennessee, and um, she would make a great politician. <laughs> and then she took our training program, was offered to join the county commission, and just the, the, the communication got flubbed up, and so she ended up not meeting the filing deadline. And she called me up, and she says, I missed the deadline, but she said, you know what? I have way too much more power as a citizen. Um, guys, I mean, it, it's phenomenal how much power you have. The founders created a country where you have all the inherent power. You just don't know how to wield it. So the ratio is actually very small. Um, what we're doing right now is we're creating farm teams of citizens across the country who are working together to wield their collective power um, uh, to drive self-governance in their community. And what I'm seeing, what I'm, what I'm observing is, is that naturally in that team, things happen, school, city, county, state, or federal, because it's all districted right here, right? I'm in the school district here. City? No. City, there's no city district here? No. Just a county? No, it's, it's right on High Street. Or three Pat, yeah. Yeah. Well, couldn't Pat and Elm Parkway split up. This yeah. whole area split up between two Right, so it's unincorporated. So unincorporated, so county, and then there's a state rep, state senator, right. congressional district, right? There's, so the, all the districts are right here. Right. So that farm team, naturally, some people will rise up and positions will open up and they just step up to the plate, but ultimately, if you're not controlling the ones who are there, you're spending all of your time and resources trying to get rid of the ones you don't like. <laughs> it's kind of like <clears throat> master with their dog and having a debate with the dog about following the rules of the household. <laughs> when really, all you want the dog to do is sit, stay, lie down, come inside, or go attack, <coughs> right? And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You're absolutely right. The representatives are human beings, but the institution itself, the founder's view was that it was something created by man. So it should remain s subservient to man. Ezra Taft Benson said this in the 1950s. He says, if God created man and man created government, and government, man should remain master over government. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to find out, uh, Brian Bollinger, uh, is he St. Genevieve or Cape? Oh, Brian Bowman? Bowman. Yes, Brian Bowman is, um, he lives in Cape, right. and he travels, he works in St. Louis. But I wanted to find out, where at is he in starting the Missouri uh, group to start teaching people throughout Missouri? Do you know? Sure. Um, he, and this is a good segue, actually, to tell you about what's happening in Missouri. Um, here, here we are. <laughs> um, so Brian is from Cape. They were the original class in January 5th of last year. They graduated in September, and now they have formed a couple of teams in Cape. One's called Paper. Uh, uh, people, uh, paper, 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 people. It's not against. It's people for government and education reform. All right, It's a really cool thing that they've created. And he is now level one certified to teach. So tomorrow he and I are joint teaching. I'm teaching a level two and a level one in Cape. Um, the other thing is we're, we're working towards forming a Missouri Center for Self-Governance. Um, and we've had classes all along I-55, down to Sykeston, <coughs> all the way up to Hannibal. Uh, as of right now, nothing has happened. Um, west, far too far west, uh, Jefferson City, Kansas City, that region, and then south. Um, my, my, what I got the report today from those folks is that there's about 130 level one students that have gone through the training. Um, and um, what's awesome, let me, can I tell you guys about Sykeston, Missouri? Sykeston, Missouri is a Democrat controlled area of Missouri and so the, the people there were really demoralized after the election they're just we're done we're not going to participate in government anymore we just don't we don't have any impact 
all this stuff. Absolutely. So, the uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. What's that? Oh, but they won. I mean, that they, I, I was surprised because you said that, that they were demoralized and they were demoralized. <coughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry. The, the, there's different groups that are there that were not Democrat, that were not happy with the outcome. And so they were demoralized, you know. Um, and so the CAPE team, they, they called us up and said, hey, can we do a, a, a presentation there? And so there's like eight people showed up for this presentation, which is what I kind of thought was going to happen tonight because it was Valentine's Day, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we go there, and eight people show up, and we, we did this presentation. The Memphis team came up, the Cape County team came up, and then CSG was there, and we did this joint presentation for the Sykeston Eight. <laughs> sure. And um, they're, they're going to do uh, level three, they're going to have their level three training in a couple weeks, and it's packed out. It's a packed out class. It's like 20 people. And they're 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 on fire in Sykeston because um, they realize it doesn't have anything to do with the issue or the candidate. It had everything to do with them wielding their power. Memphis, Tennessee, um, for the first time, uh, it, it's it's crazy. It's crazy there, guys. Um, so there's a there's a councilwoman named Janice Full of Love. Literally, Janice Full of Love. <laughs> And she it sits on the Memphis City Council, and she, she cannot stand the Tea Party that, that is in Memphis, Tennessee, <coughs> until recently. And so she called in to um, the Blaze Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys familiar with the Blaze Radio? Yeah. This is, it's, it's, uh, uh, Glenn, Beck. Glenn Beck, right? There's a guy named Glenn Beck. He has this radio station. And so, I mean, your mind is, is there's just this kind of <coughs> huge Grand Canyon gulf between this person and somebody like a Glenn Beck, you just think, right? But what's happening because of the training, these, these citizens in Memphis have been going into places you would totally think are not worth going to, talking with people who don't vote um, and, and not trying to get them to vote but convincing them to participate in government. And so what's happening is, is the residual, their focus has changed, and so the residual impact is now these people are registering to vote. <clears throat> and so Janice Fullalove is now starting to sing the praises of these citizens, and you're starting to hear the words, the language. And they don't even, it's crazy, guys, they don't even realize they're speaking the language of the, of the framers. They're speaking, they're speaking the same language. There's two languages. You can hear it in your meetings. It's the language of fear and tyranny, centralized governance, right? And, right? It's, right? Hey, you know what it smells like, um, <laughs> right? But what we, what the language we speak, when you, when you, when you, when you pay attention, it's a casserole of liberty. It's, it smells great, right? Young guys, right? We, we like, like home cooked meals, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, if you learn how to speak the language of self-governance and burn burn the sacred fire of liberty, you can bake a casserole of liberty and serve it to your fellow citizens. And guys, I mean, if, the if either one of these political parties figures out what we're doing, they'll be in power for a thousand years. <laughs> I'm serious. No, we're making up. <laughs> <laughs> your city seal teams that you go around different states and create for a visual, do you have that one slide with that SEAL team and there's a legislator and they're instructing him? Sure. Do you have, it's just amazing what, yeah. they, what they're So she, she's referring to SEAL teams. That's not what we officially call them. Someone called, someone said, you guys are like the SEALs because the training is so, it's difficult training, but the teams that come out of the training are, let me, let me ask you guys a question. I want you guys to rank rank these real quick, and then I'll pull this picture up. All right, this just I'm I'm and I'm not trying to. I, I'm really curious what you think. In terms of keeping the republic and killing Osama bin Laden, which one's more important? <laughs> okay, okay. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I have the utmost respect for the Navy SEALs because the training they go through is phenomenal. All right, they are they are America's greatest warriors. But in terms of keeping the republic, right? Mm -hmm. So someone said, so you guys are like citizen seals. I'm like, you know what? In terms of 
degrees of importance. We need some training, don't we? We need to learn how to keep the republic. They learn how to go take care of the bad guys. We need to learn how to keep it. So when it comes to, I mean, in terms of importance, the importance of being well-trained, well-oiled machine, it's like a bazillion times more. I don't know what the right words are. I'm getting there. I'll figure it out someday. Um, by the way, this is the diary of Dr. James McHenry. And right here is where he talks about this exchange between Benjamin Franklin and Mrs. Powell. Um, let me get there. Do -do -do -do. Booby dooby doo. Power. Governance. Self governance. As you can see, I, 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 I use the power, I use the presentation, but I just don't show it. <laughs> um, doo -doo. All right. Um, that's all stuff in the class. Okay. This is what she wants. <coughs> all of you guys vote. Yep. Very good. I don't want you to forget what I told you tonight, though, about Elizabeth Powell, who couldn't vote. There's a huge distinction between civic responsibility, exercising your moral obligation to participate in government. Because in America, you don't have to vote, right? And some of you would even probably agree with me, uh, or, or Mark Levin, and say, some people shouldn't vote. <laughs> Um, but how many of you know what that word means? Exercising your civic authority. <coughs> um, so uh, Helen is referring, no, this doesn't work on there. <coughs> I don't know if you guys can see this picture very well or not, but <coughs> essentially, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> this is um, some constituents. This is um, someone who is designated to hand this representative his instructions. And his instructions were simply, sit. <laughs> now, they had some other words in there, but the bottom line was, sit on your committee chair, and when this bill comes up, vote. Why? Because of the shenanigans behind the scenes. The only way we knew the shenanigans because we had citizen SEAL teams inside there. They were collecting the intelligence. They were, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? And then they were coming back, and this was going into that district, and Mrs. Powell informing the discretion of her fellow Mrs. Powells, and Mrs. Powell going, are you joking? He did what? Here, let me, I'll sign that thing. It's not a petition. There's a difference between a petition and instructing your representatives by address of remonstrance. Did you guys know that you guys... I've studied all the constitutions with regards to several different things, but one of those is regarding instructing representatives. You guys have the strongest language of all the states with regard to instructing your representatives. Listen to this. And then I'll read you mine, because I think mine's pretty cool too. The people of this state, this is Missouri, so this you, it's not me, I'm from Tennessee, right? So the people of this state have the inherent, sole, and exclusive right to regulate internal government. Woo. That's pretty powerful stuff, guys. I'll read you mine. <coughs> Article 1, Section 23, R says that the people have the right to instruct their representatives by address of remonstrance. That word address of remonstrance is the same thing that mommies do to their children. They say, take a bath. <laughs> no, take a bath. <laughs> Last time, take a bath. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Brush your teeth. Go to bed. That's what address of remonstrance means. <laughs> In Tennessee, Article 1, Section 23, the citizens have the right to instruct their representatives by address of remonstrance. You guys have the strongest language. Texas probably has the third strongest language. But the bottom line is, as citizens, the first thing is you have power, but it's also enumerated that you have the right to instruct. We don't know how to do that. We don't know how to instruct. What we do is we show up when it's too late, and then we call that instruction. So we spend no time training the Rottweiler, sit, and we show up when we want them to sit, 
and they've never been trained to sit. And so when we say sit, it attacks, <laughs> right? Then we say stop, and it keeps chewing. <laughs> and then we call the dog dumb. <laughs> right. And guess what? Eventually, you're sitting, <laughs> right? The Rottweiler has become the alpha male of the pack. It's, it's human nature. That's the tendency of centralized governance throughout mankind's history. If the citizens do not wield their power, their control over the power, and their right to instruct, sit. In this case, the instruction was sit. And I, and I mean it as a metaphor, okay? And with the, the great, we don't teach our citizens to be disrespectful at all. There's a high degree of respect that the representatives deserve at all five levels of government. They're sacrificing a lot to have their, essentially their metaphoric naked body for public review. You know what I mean? So as citizens, though, you have more power than they do. Matter of fact, the reps don't have power. They have only control. We talk about this in level one, so come. Come to learn about this stuff. They, they, the, 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 they told him to get up and walk out of a, a, a boat along with three other freshmen. And just being, you know, hey, we don't know anything about what's going on here. House leadership, they know what they're doing, right? People elected them. They must know what's going on. So they got up and walked out, right? So now we're on the verge of HB 2869, <coughs> sponsored by the number six Republican in the state of Tennessee, entitled the Implementation of the Patient Protection Affordability Care Act. It's a shocker. I mean, it's a shocker for us in Tennessee. It's actually not so shocking. Shocking to most people because they don't understand <coughs> this, <coughs> this dynamic right here. Exercising your civic authority has to do with instructing your representatives at the school, city, county, state, and federal level. That's why I asked you, are you in control? When you say sit, do they sit? When you say go, do they go? So now he's in the committee room and house leadership walks up to him and it says, hey, you might want to walk out of this bill. You tell me what he does now. He sits. So on one ear, go. Other ear, stay. <laughs> right? Who is in control of whom? <laughs> Ultimately, has to be, you have to answer that question. So you answer the question every day. How do I keep the republic? Answer the second question. Who's in control of whom? Until you're in control. Um, and Mark, your teams are pretty successful, I take it, doing that? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> we don't measure success the way you guys conventionally measure it. Did we win the issue? Did we lose the issue? Did we win the candidate? Did we lose the candidate? No. We measure success by how many teams are actually observing, collecting intelligence within the various levels of government, the strategies that they're crafting regarding their various issue policies, and informing the discretion of their fellow citizens in their particular community based on the districts of the legislatures that they're focused on. And then finally, collectively, as Mrs. Powell, are they instructing their legislative, um, their delegated authority? Um, so we have teams at the county level and below that have 100% success. Um, at the state level in Tennessee, <coughs> We, we have, it, it's down a little bit because, because the governor is fighting back. It's pretty intense. But that's, we don't measure success in terms of whether we lost the issue. We don't. We, we measure it in terms of can we actually prove to our fellow Mrs. Powells that the governor of the state of Tennessee is an obstacle of your self-governance. Not according to our emotion, not according to my speculation, but based on the evidence. What are his actions? And he's proving it right now uh, on various issues when it comes to education, health care, gun control, property rights, you name it. Same thing in Missouri. Yeah. The key is, as citizens, you have to have that in the in intel that you can transfer to the Mrs. Powells so that can happen. When that happens, 100% of the time, they will sit their butts in the chair. If that doesn't happen, won't happen. Won't happen. So our goal is uh, there's 114 counties in Missouri. We want to build a 
citizen SEAL teams across this whole state that, that know how to observe, collect intel, craft strategy, inform discretion, and instruct delegated authority. Anybody have any other questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned homework. Can you give us an example of homework and tutorials? Sure. Um, um, <coughs> so, this <coughs> whole thing has to do with communication. If we don't communicate with each other, we cannot keep the republic. We will not build our relationships that we need. And ultimately, you're incapable of capturing the intel you need to drive the discussion. And that requires communication. So our homework has two pathways from level one to five, the spoken word and the written word. Spoken is verbal, written is also verbal. Um, <clears throat> so the written, the written communications ultimately ends up, whatever you're passionate about, whatever issue you're passionate about, by the time you graduate level five, there's a, there's a lady named Barbara Bernard She's a grandma in Cape, and she, she is the lady who discovered that there's actually statutory code that defines marriage between a man and a woman hidden in the health care uh, title of the, what, what's it called here, revised Missouri statutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So her research, her passion was marriage between a man and a woman, right? So... She drove the issue with her writing and she drove the issue with her speaking. Um, and then by the end of her level five, she had a policy paper that she wrote. Um, you'll meet with up to 14 different types of government officials, um, both elected and unelected bureaucrats. And you eventually will write a uh, policy. And that sounds crazy because they have think tanks that take a lot of your money to write policy, but actually in the United States of America, the citizens have the right to write policy. Mm -hmm. And it's not as complicated as you think. But I actually don't get any education on when they find them. And can you work on this as a group once you get up to the higher level? Oh, absolutely. The team, the team <coughs> in Cape, um, they wrote joint policy for the superintendent. Uh, based on their strategy, based on the intelligence they gathered, and now their superintendent is um, absolutely um, uh, exposed. So I encourage you guys, check out our website, coordinate with Helen, find out how to keep the republic. If anything, ask the question <coughs> every day, and look forward to working with you guys. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.